presentation is really about the implications for people and for policies and not even so much about what kind of policies that we need as how do we make those policies who makes the policies and how do we make choices so really that is the um, idea behind this presentation i'll start it's it's not at all a technical presentation i have mainly photographs maybe some charts from some studies but mainly photographs and uh, i'll step away from the himalayas i know this presentation this this whole uh, symposium is about the himalayas but for just two slides if you could permit me i'll step away to other parts of the world first to antarctica and then to africa and then come back to the himalayas so this picture is actually taken from uh, by my former colleague who had a chance to visit antarctica and on the left you can see snow which has turned red and this is actually a warning sign of global warming because there's a particular algae in the snow which uh, changes color changes pigmentation in order to protect itself from warming and that's what gives the snow this appearance of being blood red uh, they call it watermelon snow and there's a study by Lutz et al 2016 which shows how the number of watermelon snow sites has increased over the last few years as a indicator of climate change this also has a feedback effect because the albedo effect is less when the snow is darker rather than white the picture on the right shows a very grassy uh, land very very different from what you imagine antarctica to be like so my colleague was very set, uh, surprised and the reason why there's so much grass is because there's nitrogen trapped in the ice and snow which uh, when the snow melts because of warming this nitrogen in fact acts as a fertilizer and so you have grassy uh, land rather than ice bound as as climate changes happen so um, this is just a sign of glaciers all over the world actually melting and and in the case of antarctica we know that you know in fact the ice sheet is melting from below as the ice comes into contact with warmer ocean water so it's it's actually far more complex and far more imminent almost than sometimes the models can capture uh, this picture is from africa and you can see the locusts in the field and this again is an example of how in 2019 we were affected by multiple compound climatic climatic events because the monsoon in india was delayed and conditions were such that there was more moisture in the air these locusts which usually start from africa and continue to afghanistan pakistan because of the pandemic the pesticide spraying couldn't happen in time the monitoring surveillance wasn't happening as usual and so these locusts crossed over reached almost madhya pradesh in fact some even reached mumbai and uh, this was just an example of how our world is so interconnected and how we are getting these compound impacts we had for example in 2019 this locust attack the pandemic a cyclone many more things so with that let me come to the himalayas but with a slightly personal story so this was my daughter who uh, went to triund uh, in 2019 summer and she's almost about to cry over here you can see from her face because she had hiked up to the top of triun because she was hoping to see snow for the first time and that's where the snow line is supposed to be and that year she was on reaching the top she was told that the snow was still 7 kilometers away from the snow line from the typical snow line and she was uh, she came back and told me mummy this is climate change so just wanted to put in a personal story there and say that you know the, the thing is with uh, with the himalayan states that we have there is so much that is changing it is not only climate change that's that's changing but it is also there's migration there's urbanization cities are growing hydropower is being built roads are being built cropping patterns are changing so when we study climate impacts even though our models may look only at the scientific elements and try our best through the models to capture reality reality is always far more complex and far more interlinked and far more personal many aspects of climate change for example are very well known like the fact that uh, apples in the himachal pradesh you know this is like one of the earliest very well known examples of of climate change a lot of people will tell you about it but there are um, you know so many other issues that are uh, happening and glacier melt is one which has really caught the attention of a lot of people and you've all been discussing how to model glaciers a glacier melt the karakoram anomaly because some glaciers are not retreating at the same rate i just wanted to mention a couple of studies over here uh, one is by moria retal 
which found you know a new data set of satellite data from the cold war either when russia and us were you know uh, spying on each other and they used that data set to find that the ice loss in the himalayas has doubled in the last 40 years another study by lo et al is saying that you know maybe 100000 years ago there was a uh, somewhat melt of glaciers in the summer when the northern hemisphere was tilted towards the sun but now the response rate is so fast that earlier you could say maybe 25% of the glacier melt could be attributed to anthropogenic climate change and now it's almost as if all of it is due to human induced climate change i also vividly remember a presentation made by uh, scott overbeck who studies tropical glaciers and he said that when he went up to one particular glacier i think it was in uh, latin america the glacier had retreated and there was fossilized evidence of plant matter from hundreds and thousands of years before so there was plant matter there before the problem is that now the rate at which these glaciers are melting is so fast that we are not able to really cope we have never seen this kind of rapid res- rapid response rate in the past but glacier melt is of interest to not just scientists but also to economists and those of you who read times of india the economic times will be familiar with the weekly column of swami nathan and kleshwar ayer and a few months ago he came up with a very provocative piece saying yes glaciers are melting but there's no need to panic and he's basically saying that you know government of india need not worry about it and so on and I encourage you to go and read the piece because he's actually reviewed three different studies and i'll just uh, mention those and the studies that he's talking about are trying to estimate what is the downstream impact of glacier melt on river runoff particularly for the millions of people who live in the plains of northern india there is a oft quoted study by imazi letal i think there were a number of papers which found that as much as 40% of uh, of river runoff could be attributed to glacier melt and so basically what they're saying is that what happens in the mountains will affect millions of people downstream another study by u et al puts that uh, that sort of share of glacier melt at 19% and the study that uh, swaminathan ankleshwar ayer writes about in his article cites an, another study by armstrong et al which says only 4% is because of glacier melt and he says that uh, that a lot of the confusion is because snow melt and ice melt have been mixed up and finally monsoon river monsoon rainfall will account for the majority the bulk of the river runoff downstream and so india need not worry even if all the glaciers melt only 4% of our river uh, you know ganga and yamuna river water comes from the glaciers so we don't have to panic now is this a valid uh, inference even if this methodology is correct uh, there are glaciologists like david hanna in the university of birmingham who said that it is very hard to model glaciers that are covered with debris and also that you know what you may get is seasonal seasonality so river runoff may become more spiky there are people who are saying that you know in the summer for example the dry season before the monsoon rains come if you have shortage of rainfall then you would need to basically cope with that you would need to prepare for that maybe having some kind of water harvesting structures when you need a little uh, water in the hot dry summer season particularly with temperatures rising so this is a very uh, kind of complex issue and even if you uh, look at the uh, studies that look at glacier melt and downstream river runoff there are other issues for example what happens to the agriculture that depends this is a picture from you know 10 years no 15 years ago that i think i had taken when i was doing field work in uttarakhand in lakwar district and chakrata district of uttarakhand and uh, you can see first of all how how small the and fragmented the land holdings are this is terrace farming it's all almost entirely rain fed uh, this particular picture i don't think you can see but this is actually water that is just falling down and this will be used to irrigate the fields and to run a little mill uh, so this is the nature of the agriculture in the fields and you those of you who are from this region or who are familiar with you know uh, with this area will know how hard it is how difficult it is uh, to make a living from agriculture in this area and and how widespread the migration is so we need to take into account what will be the changes because of snowfall change early snow melt rainfall change uh, mountain stream runoff change all of this on people who depend on agriculture here uh, when i spoke to people in this area they used to say that in the early years you know like if you spoke to an elderly lady and she said when i came to this village as a bride 
the snow was like manure it would settle and it would enrich the soil you know and uh, now it's happening earlier in the year uh, similarly if you think of mountain streams and even the insects the aquatic insects uh, that uh, that you know uh, have their habitat what will happen when these the stream water becomes a little warmer what will happen with the you know the meadows in this area uh, this picture actually these daisies are an invasive species they don't actually belong over here but but the point is that it's an entire food chain an entire ecosystem and livelihoods depend on it so for example pastoralism is something which is very important for this region and we don't actually take into account in really any part of our country what would be the down what would be the implications of these kinds of climatic changes on the communities that depend on them let me give you a slightly different point right now a lot of people i'm sure are aware that you know growing extreme rainfall events landslides even glacier lake outburst flood events will have major implications for hydropower that is being built in the mountains maybe that infrastructure needs to be made more resilient maybe you need to spend more in order to raise the height of these dams or strengthen and fortify them but actually water is important for all kinds of power plants um, thermal power plants for example use a lot of water for cooling you can see that there aren't any thermal power plants in say himachal pradesh or uttarakhand but in the plains there are a lot of thermal power plants and these depend on fresh water for cooling the red and dark red areas are those areas which are already water stressed and so um, the point that i would uh, like you to take away is that what happens in the mountains will have implications not just for natural resource based livelihoods in the mountains but also for the energy security of the entire country um i'll now talk about um, i'll just show you three different charts or maps from uh, a database you can you must welcome to look at it it's it's by my organization world resources institute and it has a lot of uh, publicly available data sets but let's look at what happens with tourism for example these are the major tourism sites of uttarakhand we have religious tourism we have you know hiking trekking adventure sports wildlife tourism but uh, for example the char dham yatra is something which draws crores of tourists every year so you have yamunotri gangotri kedarnath and badrinath as as growing tourism sites the size of these circles represents the number of tourists and these blue lines are basically the water basins the drainage of the rivers so you can see that all of all of the important um, you know tourism sites of uttarakhand are located along these kinds of rivers and streams these red dots show you where landslide events have happened this is slightly dated data it's from 2015 it's not up to date but you can see that you know you are basically having a kind of juxtaposition of growing numbers of tourists coming to areas where the hazard is also growing so these are landslides and this uh, slide basically maps the baseline water vulnerability so water scarcity red obviously means more stressed yellow means less stressed it's not taking into account future changes because of climate change because it may happen that in the short run there may be more water available and in the long run there will be less water available there would also be seasonality differences but here what you have is a juxtaposition of three factors existing water stress existing landslides and growing numbers of tourists so this is something that is very important when we try to build the economy of the mountain regions based on industries like tourism and hydropower and road development all of which are highly vulnerable to climatic hazards let me now just come spend a little bit of more time talking about agriculture vulnerability and as you can see over here roads are really a very important bottleneck for making sure that you know uh, for agricultural prosperity in this region unless farmers are connected to the markets they're not able to get the right prices for their produce and they're really not able to um, uh, able to make a, a profit from farming so road construction is definitely very important market access is extremely important but in in the way of how we build these roads where we collect the material from do we give adequate uh, safety measures you know when this when the road construction is happening all of this becomes extremely important so in uh, uh, as i said around 2005 i did field work in uh, a few villages in uttarakhand um, and what we were trying to do at that time was a couple of things we were trying to share with them 
climate science, uh, like climate model results for this region, both in terms of temperature rise and rainfall rise, but also uh, the results of, say, uh, SWOT model uh, results for river water runoff. And we wanted the community to understand what these future projections were saying for 30, 50, 100 years from now, from that time. And, and then to say, does this make sense to you? Does this relate to your lived experience? And if this is what the future will bring, then what kinds of adaptation options would you recommend? Um, so this is actually a group of women who were, who were looking at this. And I wanted to spend it because this is really my second last slide. I wanted to spend a little time uh, talking about the impact of these kinds of um, uh, climatic events and uh, socioeconomic impacts, particularly from a woman's perspective. First of all, we all know that women, especially in the mountains, spend a lot of time collecting firewood and water. And um, if these kinds of resources, natural resources, their scarcity grows, then there will also be uh, more competition over scarce resources and there could be inequity in, in accessing these scarce resources. So that's the general kind of perception with which development organizations design their interventions. However, it's very important to use the right kinds of gender metrics. Usually people um, go in talking about time taken or distance traveled as a measure of women's work burden. I wanted to mention two studies. One is uh, by a former colleague of mine from Terry, Deepthi Chatti, who was doing her PhD in Yale. And she was looking at a couple of different locations, Himachal Pradesh in the north, and um, I think Gadag district in Karnataka in, in the south, and looking at how LPG access is improving women's uh, access to um, cooking, uh, cooking, and hence perhaps even their health implications because of air quality. Just uh, yeah. So what she found was that in in Himachal Pradesh, the process of firewood collection tends to be a seasonal activity. It is it is not necessarily a daily activity. Women can collect, uh, you know, two to three times during the season, go and collect large amounts of firewood and store it in the house, use it not only for cooking, but also for warming the house. Uh, the house. Uh, so it's a slightly different way. And when you try to basically replace firewood by LPG, what is important is not just the first connection to LPG, but also is it uh, is it easy? Is it affordable? Is it uh, not very time consuming to get the cylinder refill? And here we find that it is men rather than women who are able to um, access, you know, to spend time in the in the uh, depots in order to get the LPG refills. So again, the, what I'm saying, what I'm trying to say with this example is that the picture is a little com complex. In South India and Gadag, in a highly drought-prone district, the scarcity of firewood changes the equation completely, and LPG is becoming actually very important. So all these kinds of national policies sometimes play out a little differently depending on the natural resource context of the specific state or district where it's being implemented. The second example I want to give is from Vishal Narayan's work in the foothills of Himachal Pradesh of the Shivaliks for water. And there a kind of intervention was designed where they said that instead of women having to go to the river in order to fetch water, let us install hand pumps in the village itself. And that will make women's life easy. Instead, it was found that women's work actually increased because when earlier men would go to the river to bathe or to bathe their cattle, now they expected that women should go and fill water from the hand pump and bring it to the house for their bathing. So actually the women's um, distance travel became less, but the time and effort became more. So I just wanted to give these as a couple of examples of how policies play out on the ground. And this is really my last slide, which is, um, you know, I started by saying, what is the impact on people and what is the implication for policy? Finally, it is the people themselves who should be able to feed into the policy making by saying what kinds of interventions would be the most relevant for them, how they need to be designed and implemented in a way that they are effective. And uh, one particular approach that we had over here was really participation in a kind of visioning exercise and looking at different scenarios. There are also other efforts that I'd be happy to talk about with their questions, which we did in Assam where we did even things like group model building, where we brought into the same room officials from, say, the uh, disaster management department, the water resources department, indigenous communities and farmers and, and others, and, and uh, as well as academics from IIT Gohati. 
and they participated in their own kind of conceptual modeling of what causes floods in the upper Brahmaputra Valley. And when they heard each other's diagnosis of cause and effect, they found they were completely different. The local communities were giving a completely different diagnosis than the academic engineers and the uh, government officials responsible for compensating people were coming up with a completely different diagnosis. When they heard each other, their perceptions changed a little. And then they went back and redid their models and came up with different solutions. So that's really, I would say, the way forward. Doing research that is not only disciplinary, not only interdisciplinary, but transdisciplinary, which is involving the affected community, the affected stakeholders, right from the problem definition stage itself, and using that to guide your research. So let me close with that and thank uh, again the organizers for giving me this opportunity to talk about some of my work. Thank you.